I want to start off with a question like I often do, not always, but often, right? I want you to think about what is currently your greatest fear? What is currently your greatest fear? Now, I'm not asking you to think long and hard about what should be the greatest thing that you should be afraid of. You know, we, we would say, you know, not pleasing the Lord or something like that. I'm not asking you that question. I'm not asking you to, to think long and hard in, in that way. I want you to think currently, what's making you uneasy? Right now, what is on your mind that's giving you some trouble, that's, that's troubling you in that way, creating fear in your life? Get that in your mind for just a moment, and it can be the first thing that pops into your mind. There's a lot of good options right now. Elections, conflicts, unrest, war, division, discrimination, um, job insecurity, an unstable economy, right? Inflation, all these different things. The next generation, what are they going to be like? What are they like now? <laughs> all, that, uh, all that good kind of stuff. The rapid rate of change in our, our culture, in our nation, and across the world, those kinds of things. Um, Russia, China, all the nations who want to be like them and want to uh, be with them, right? We could, we could come up with a list of things uh, that may not ultimately be all that important, but do create real fear in our lives. We could do that pretty quickly. But this morning, we are going to kick off what I hope will be a really valuable time together uh, for the month of December, a new message series called Fear Not. Uh, fear Not. And as we do this, I want you to think about this as we get ready to, to begin if you think our days right now are full, full of reasons to fear, consider what it must have been like when God sent Jesus into the world for the people who were on the earth at that time. Consider what it must have been like. I would argue that it may have created some fear in people's lives. When God sent Jesus through the miraculous virgin birth, sent his one and only son in the flesh, to essentially invade the plans of some people, right? I mean, granted, he was making an impact, was here to make an impact on all people. But there are some people that we can read about in the scripture who he made an impact on immediately, well, not even immediately, we would say, we could say even before he arrived, right? You're immediately thinking of some people right now, aren't you? Some people in the scriptures who even before Jesus arrived on the scene, before he was born, that before he experienced that humble birth and the whole world received him, there were some people who had their own plans, who were living their own lives, and suddenly God, uh, through his angels, approached them and called them into service, right? Can you think of some off the top of your head that we know about? Uh, they're the major players in our uh, Christmas story, as we like to call it, right? Right? He called them into service to play a role in bringing his one and only begotten son, Jesus, into the world. Now, we're going to look at a few of these. We're going to look at four of these people. Uh, the last one is a group of people. Uh, but we're going to look at four different events over the next few weeks uh, of situations where these people were approached by God through his angels, and they needed to fear not, right? Because an angel appeared to them, and immediately they were gripped with fear. Immediately fear struck them and immediately the angels had to say do not fear because that was the immediate response of each one of these people. Each one that we're going to look at in this message series, their immediate response was fear and uncertainty but God's plan, of course, sending Jesus into the world, we know, was actually intended to do exactly the opposite. Not create fear but instead to bring peace, to remove the fear that they were living in. We mentioned all these great options of things for us to be afraid of right now. And, and God's plan is bigger than all of that. That's how God sending Jesus into the world was able to take away fear. And that's how God uh, sending Jesus into our world, us receiving him today, that's how fear is supposed to go out of our lives. Because we follow Jesus, because uh, we are uh, rejoicing in him. God's plan was to remove fear and embolden those people and us as well today to trust him, to be able to do that without fear, to be able to obey him without the fear of all this stuff going on in the world and, and what might happen, what may come. Hey, we know what's going to happen, right? We follow Jesus. We know the end of the story, and that's not some cliche thing that we like to throw out. That's the truth. That's the honest truth. So he, it was meant to, God's plan was meant to remove fear 
It was meant to embolden us to trust and obey and, of course, to go and share the, the good news of great joy that was for all people. We're supposed to go share it with all people. And so we're not just going to talk about little baby Jesus in a stable this month. We'll, we'll touch on that. But, but there's going to be so much more substance here. And we're going to talk about our responsibility because God came into the world and it creates some fear, but it's meant to take away fear and it's meant to cause us to, to be emboldened to trust, obey, and go and share the message with other people, okay? And so we're going to see, much like it should in our lives, each of these people that we see throughout this message series, that fear faded as they surrender their plans for his plans, their lives for the life of his son. As they did that, that fear faded and they served him as they should. Jesus was coming was the message for them and everything needed to change. Today, the message for us, Jesus has come and guess what? Still, everything must change. So I want to bring you uh, the first message this morning called Fear Not Zacharias. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 5. Fear Not Zacharias. We're going, to, we're going to see who Zacharias was and the role that he played in bringing Jesus into the world, okay? He was involved in, in a way. We're going to look at how he played a role in that story. And as we look at this uh, story of Zacharias specifically, we're going to find out, we're going to discover and see that God plans, we have a God who plans, and he uses his people in his plans. We have a God who prepares. We're going to see that as well. And he uses us, his creation, his people, to help prepare people, to prepare men's hearts to receive him. And finally, we're going to see that we have a God who performs. We have a God who performs. He does what he says he's going to do. And so he expects us to trust him to do that. He's never let us down. He's promised he will, and he's always come through. And so we have a God who not just performs, but expects us to trust that he's going to perform. And so we can confidently, knowing that he performs, we can trust, we can obey, we can go and share the message, knowing that God's going to do exactly as he promises, all right? So let's look at the text here. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 if you're not there yet, or I will have it up here on the screen. Starting in verse 5, the scripture says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Here it is. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. And fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. For your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So a couple things right off the bat that we learn about Zacharias is that he was a priest, right? He had a wife named Elizabeth. They were advanced in years. And as of yet, they had not produced a child from their union. Now we also learn something about their character, right? Not just who they were and what had and hadn't happened in their lives, but we learn something about their character. We learn that Zacharias and Elizabeth were God-fearing people, but not just God-fearing, they were genuinely righteous people, right? It's one thing to say someone's God-fearing or to say they're a believer or to say they go to church, but to be genuinely righteous people is a whole different thing. Verse six of our text said that they were both righteous in whose sight? In the sight of men? in the sight of their religious elite, in the sight of their family, in the sight of people who, who wanted them to have a, a good, clean reputation, in the sight of who? God, yeah. Whose sight matters? 
God's, yeah. It only matters how God sees you. In the mind of God, who are you? Well, the Bible says they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. So these were God-honoring people whom God used for his plans. He used them for his plans to prepare people to be ready for the coming of the Lord, to be ready with softened hearts, with minds ready to receive this Jesus, this Savior, this this new, what what appeared like a new thing, even though it had been prophesied for for years and years and years, generations and generations, and had been the plan since before the foundations of the earth, to get them ready for the entry of this Savior, the Christ, what he was really going to be like and what he was really going to require from men. They were going to be used by God to do this. They were going to play a role in bringing Jesus into the world. And so the very first valuable thing that we should take note of from this part of the story is the fact that God plans. I told you that's the first thing we're going to see, that God plans. God is one who plans. He certainly is not the version of God, the version of God that some people have created. The one who had an idea, created the creation as we see it today, and then it's kind of just been so hands-off that he is as uncertain as we are about where this is all going. That's not the God we serve. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not God really at all. The God of the Bible plans. He's a planner. He has long-term plans. We know that. We don't have the patience for that, do we? (laughs) He has short-term plans, though, too. Hey, you've got that opportunity. Take advantage of it. Ah, Did you? Did you not? But he has eternal plans as well. That's a biggie. God has eternal plans. Long-term, short-term, eternal. And certainly God's plans are on display here in Luke chapter 1, are they not? While Zacharias was in the temple, that angel, uh, while, while Zacharias was performing his priestly service, that angel appeared to the right of the altar of incense right? And fear gripped him. It scared him uh, to death, you might say. That's the way we would put it into our words. He was gripped with fear, though, is what the scripture says. But the angel tells him, fear not, because he's actually come to bring good news, right? He's actually come to bring uh, really good news, and that good news is what? It's God's plan. He's come to tell Zacharias part of God's plan, to reveal to him the part of God's plan that he wants to use Zacharias for. And if we dig into the details of what this plan was, what the angel explained to Zacharias, if we look at that, we learn just how well God plans. Because there's a lot here. We can go back hundreds and hundreds of years to the book of Malachi, right? You got the book of Malachi, you got this 400 or so years of silence, and then you've got all this stuff that we're reading about now. So we're going back some 400 years back, and we see that God has been planning. We're going to look at Malachi in just a moment. We're going to see that God's been planning to send John the Immerser into the world for quite some time to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord, okay? Look at Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 with me. It says, Behold, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Now, verse 6 should sound extremely familiar because it's almost word for word. It's clearly what the angel was relaying in verse 17 of our text. Luke chapter 1, verse 17. We get almost the same thing here. This was the plan for John that's being mentioned here. I know that according to Malachi, it says uh, he's going to send Elijah though, right? Well, listen to what Jesus says for us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14. He says, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Jesus interprets the scripture for us here. The Bible always interprets itself. We don't, we don't have to wonder what the Bible means. If we just keep reading, if we learn, if we go back and then we go forward, if we, un- if we can understand it. The Bible will interpret itself. But also, listen to what uh, we have over here in Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, after Jesus' transfiguration, his disciples had questions about what some of the scribes say about how Elijah must come first. And, you know, they've got all these, it's kind of like today, all these people who are writing these books and they got all these weird, like, like religious conspiracy theories and things. The scribes had some of that going on as well. You know, they had thoughts that they had and some disagreed and some agreed and there was division and all that stuff. Not a whole lot new under the sun, right? It <laughs> kind of sounds like today. But, Jesus says in verses 12 and 13, he says, I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And in verse 13, the Bible says, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Jesus says this Elijah to come in Malachi 
is John the Baptist. He's going to come. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. John the Baptist was this Elijah who was to come, the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's what Malachi 4 said. It was prophesying, and that's what the angel was explaining in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. So all the way back in Malachi, some 400 years before John's birth, God had these plans to send him into the world to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord, this arrival of Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah that everyone had been waiting for. But if we think about it, we know that God had these plans, these plans to send a Savior way before this, long before this, far more than 400 years or so, for sure. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 says, just as he, that is God the Father, chose us in him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. So th this, we don't have time to explain everything that's going on in, in the, the letter to the Ephesians right now, but you can see right here that the plan for us to be saved in Christ, that God made this plan, he chose to do this, for us to be in him, to be found uh, holy and blameless in him and before God. He, this plan has been around since before the foundation of the world. God's been planning for a while, my friends. He's been at this for a while. He's been looking out for us before the foundation of the world, before time began, before creation. God knew a Savior was needed for us. He, he knew his plan. He knew the terms. He knew what was required. He knew he would have to send a Savior as a sacrifice to save us. Now, as we come back to Zacharias' story in Luke chapter 1, we see that God's plans involve using his creation. He intended to use, and did use, Zacharias. He used uh, Elizabeth, of course, as well, to deliver John, the one who would prepare the way, to prepare people for the coming of the Lord, to prepare the world for that event, for that uh, person to come. The, the world would never be the same after it. And so as the angel told Zacharias in the temple, he and Elizabeth both needed to, to fear not. Because God was going to use him and use his wife to do great things, to carry out his will. And we know, I know I'm not telling you anything new, we know God still uses his people to carry out his plans today. God still has plans. Those plans are being executed right now. They're playing out. And he still uses his people for that. Consider what Ephesians 2 verse 10 says. This is talking about Christians. It says, we are his workmanship. Okay? What's, what would be your workmanship? Something you created. Something you made for a purpose. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not just any good works. The ones which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, Zacharias and Elizabeth were not the first, nor will they be the last, whom God calls into service, who has uh, plans intended for them to carry out. Those of us who are Christians today, we have been created new in Christ Jesus for good works. The ones which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So that you would walk in them. So that I would walk in them. God has created opportunities. He has plans that he wants you to carry out. Now, it's not some weird, mystical, crazy, well, what's my assignment? Is there a bulletin board somewhere? Do I pray for it and then I hear an audible voice? No, 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 no. It's in the scripture. We all have the same assignment. We all have the same duty. But hey, you can also read in the scripture that you have special talents that other people don't. I have special talents that you don't have. The person in the back corner has some that you don't. Th that's just how it works. And so we're all going to be doing slightly different things, but we're all working toward the same goal. We're not all a foot. We're not all a hand. We're not all an eye. We're not all the mouth, the nose, the ears, or anything else. So it's going to look different, but it's nothing mystical. Read the scriptures. Read the letters to the churches, and you'll see exactly what we're supposed to be doing. But we've been created new in Christ Jesus so that we'd walk in these good works. So fear not and jump in. Get involved. Start preaching and teaching and helping and serving and sacrificing and volunteering and rejoicing with those who need rejoice with and mourning with those who need mourned with. Grieve with other people. Be there for other people. Provide for other people. Start ministering is what we're supposed to be doing. Walk in these good works. God wants to use us to carry out his plans. Fear not. Let God use you. I mean, starting today. Starting today. Now, if we look at what God's plan was for Zacharias here, we learn that God prepares. He doesn't just plan and jump right on it. He's a preparer. He's, he's a God who prepares hearts. Before God brought a Savior into the world, he knew that the fields needed some prepping, some prep work. He knew the soil needed to be turned over a little bit, needed to be tilled up, uh, prepared in such a way that it could receive this seed that he was sending into the world. 
See, God softens hearts. God teaches uh, basic truths, basic concepts first, so that more complex spiritual concepts can be understood later on. In fact, we know God leads entire generations through very specific physical circumstances so that future generations could understand uh, very important, real, spiritual, vital, critical truths when they come along, generations down the line, uh, perhaps when a, a covenant changes, <laughs> right? We know how God works. We know that God has plans, and we know that God's a preparer. He, he works. He doesn't just throw stuff on us. He prepares you to receive what he needs to, you to, to understand. Let's revisit Malachi one more time. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Again, the scripture we looked at before where he says, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah and the, uh, Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now listen, he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that, okay, there, there's, a, there's some preparation going on, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So that something else will happen instead. See, God brought John the Baptist into the world through Zacharias and Elizabeth to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, we said, right? God's preparing them. God used Zacharias and Elizabeth to bring this child into the world so they'd be ready for the Savior of the world. Zacharias and Elizabeth played a vital role, therefore, in bringing the Savior into the world. There was work that needed to be done first. Preparation work, right? In our text, in Luke chapter 1, in verse 17, uh, again, the angel said, it is he, that's John, that we're talking about, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So <clears throat> without the preaching of John the immerser, without the rebuking of John, without the, the fearless, relentless, in-your-face exposure of the religious elite, without John doing all these things to make ready a people prepared for the Lord, apparently God in his infinite wisdom knew that there would be an opportunity lost. He understood that this preparation needed to take place. God knew that, and so God intended to prepare people in this way. God recognized that the people needed preparing. The soil needed that working over first. And so he used, again, he uses people. He used Zacharias and he used his wife Elizabeth as well. Both righteous in the sight of God, blameless in the way they kept the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. He used them for this preparation work. See, God has plans and he uses people in those plans. God prepares. He's a God who prepares and he uses people in that preparation. People needed prepared, but God also used people to prepare those people. And, and folks, God still uses us. He still uses his people to prepare men's hearts to receive Jesus today. Right? There's some people that just won't be ready for it. They need some preparation. They need some, some Christians praying that their hearts will be softened. They need some Christians praying for opportunities to, to minister to them, to uh, evangelize, to share the gospel with them. They need us to be preparing the way so that they can receive him rather than with a hard heart reject him right off the bat because they just weren't ready to hear that information yet. This is the way it works. You know, I don't know what you've heard, but this is how it really works. God plans and God prepares and he uses people to prepare people. So fear not and let God use you. Guys, we're the church. Fear not and let God use you to prepare people for Jesus to come into their lives. Romans 10, 17, we know what that says. It says that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We know those facts. How are they gonna hear if we're not talking? A person can't have faith without hearing the message of Christ, it says. So a person can't be prepared for the Lord to come into their life in a, a, a real and meaningful way, the way he's supposed to. They can't be ready for him to invade their plans. They can't be ready for him to change them unless they hear the word of Christ, the message concerning Christ, the gospel. They, they, they've got to hear that. And it's worth noting that just before we come to this passage, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we find Paul writing about the facts that one must believe in order to be saved. And in verse 14, he says, how will they believe in him, Jesus, whom they have not heard? Right? They haven't heard about him. They haven't heard from him. How will they hear? And how will they hear without a preacher? Someone to talk about him. Someone to share the good news of great joy that was for all people, right? Right? And then verse 15 says, how beautiful, here's a compliment for those who do share this information, how beautiful are the feet 
of those who bring good news of good things. We can sit at home. We can sit in a church building. We can sit where it's comfortable. We can sit in a movie theater. We can sit in a restaurant. Or we can use our feet to go, to, to bring to people the, this good news of good things. So we must not be ashamed, sticking with Paul's words, uh, Romans 1.16, we should not be ashamed of the gospel, but instead each and every single one of us needs to go and preach it. Each and every single one of us needs to be the preacher, the one with the, the beautiful feet who go and share that good news, right? Who go and teach it and share it and spread it so that others can be prepared to meet the Lord, so that they can actually uh, receive him with gladness rather than with fear and rejection, I guarantee you we've all got loved ones. We've all got family members. We've all got friends. We've all got people that we'd like to see saved through a relationship, a real relationship with Christ. God wants you to prepare them. God wants you to prepare those people to meet his son. So will you be a Zacharias? Will you follow the example of Zacharias? Will you uh, remember the angel's words? Do not be afraid, Zacharias. I got good news. Savior's coming. I need you to prepare some people. I'm going to use you to prepare people. Will you do that? Finally, as we consider these plans that were announced for the purpose of preparing people for the impending birth of Christ, we learn that God performs. <clears throat> Excuse me. God always does what he says he'll do. He performs. Right? Do we know this? Are we confident of this? I'm not being rude, but it doesn't sound like it. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29, Samuel shares this eternal truth about God. He says, the glory of Israel, that's God, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. And then in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, the Lord himself is quoted as saying, so will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty. Without, this is a big word, accomplishing. I'm not talking about the length or the number of syllables. I'm talking about uh, the, the, the weight of this word. Without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. We have a God who, who accomplishes things, who performs, who succeeds. And so when I say, do we know that our God keeps his word and does what he says he should do? The church should go, yes. <laughs> yes, I do, right? That's what we should do. We have a God who doesn't change his mind. He makes up his mind. He plans, he prepares, and he does what he says he's going to do. He performs without fail. He succeeds. He accomplishes what he says he's going to do. Well, in our text in Luke chapter 1, we see that God indeed performed what he said he was going to do. His plan to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. In its most basic sense, in uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 57, we see that John was born. Right? Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. That was John. God indeed performed. He gave this son, John, to Zacharias and Elizabeth. This son, this John, who would perform everything that God said he would perform. He was everything God said he would, he would be. If you've got your Bible in front of you, you can look at the text. Everything it said that John would do, and we see that he did it. John was indeed great in the sight of the Lord. Didn't the angel say he would be great in the sight of the Lord? You can write down Luke chapter 7 verse 28 if you want to look that up for yourself. He did not drink wine or liquor, right? We get his diet in Matthew chapter 3 verse 4. He was filled with the Holy Spirit even while in his mother's womb. You can look at Luke chapter 1 verse 44. And here's the important thing. Here's the preparation part. He did turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Matthew chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 says, Then Jerusalem was coming out to him. And all Judea, this is a lot of space, a lot of ground getting covered here. Jerusalem was going out to him, all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Imagine that. People who before were taking goats to the temple, lambs, Pagan animals, you know, sacrificing. People who were, were struggling with their sin and, and hiding it and burying it. And, and now there's people coming to this man in the wilderness. Just, just some random guy. No. John, the one who was sent to prepare these people. And they're confessing their sins. We don't even do that in the church today. We're supposed to. God is preparing these people. God used John the Baptist. 
And he did that by first using Zacharias. By sending an angel, telling that angel to tell Zacharias, fear not. I got good news actually. I'm going I'm to use you. Sometimes good news can still be scary news, right? That's kind of what this sort of was. A people were prepared for the Lord through God's planning, through his preparation, and certainly through his performance. Zacharias and Elizabeth just needed to fear not and get on board, to, to be used, to participate in God's plan, to, to, to bring this child into the world. They had to, to parent and prepare John. They had to name and nurture John. They had to be the father and the mother of the one who was going to uh, raise up and prepare these people to change these hard-hearted people into people who would come to a river from all the district around the Jordan and confess their sins in a line, one after another, after another, after another. And those people, many of them, were ready when Jesus came to receive this Son of God. And you know where this is going. We, too, must trust God and do His will because He always performs. We need to get that confidence. We need to get that confidence that the Lord is going to perform. That he's going to accomplish what he intends to accomplish. He's going to succeed in what he says he's going to do. Psalm 910 tells us. It says, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. There's another big word, trust. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. He doesn't say that he doesn't let some people down. It doesn't say that some people will, will be upset with him and curse his name. It says those who seek him, he won't forsake. So this is conditional. He will not forsake you if you seek him. Speaking of seeking, Matthew 6.33, we're all very familiar with Jesus' words here. But seek Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things, right? All the things we're anxious about, clothing and food and where we're going to live and all this stuff, eat and drink. All these things will be added to you. It doesn't say uh, this is the only way that it might happen. Better do it just in case. It says will be. It'll be accomplished. God will succeed in providing that stuff to you, the stuff you need to survive. If you're seeking him as first priority, God will provide. You know, sometimes I think, I think we think, I know I've been there, that really doing what the Lord calls us to do, I mean, not just some version of it, not just what we're comfortable with, but really doing what God really wants us to do, it can feel like jumping out of an airplane. Let me explain. Not everyone's going to do it, right? Not everybody's going to do it. It does sound exhilarating. It kind of sounds a little terrifying as well uh, at different parts of it. And it would be quite an accomplishment to pull it off and to be able to say you did it. But there's always the fear. There's always the fear that that little pack on your back won't do what it says it will do, right? And that fear causes many people to never try. We know what God requires of us. We know what will please him. Are we afraid that he's not going to do what he said he'll do? I know I have been. I know I still am at times. So I'm not beating up on you. I'm saying, when I say we, I really mean we. Are, are we afraid that he won't do what he says he's going to do? Are we afraid that he's not going to be there to catch us, to protect us, to hold us up with his mighty right hand, like the scripture says he will? Are we afraid that he's not going to be there to deliver us when we need to be delivered? The scripture says he does not forsake those who seek him. He will provide for you when you seek him and his righteousness first in your life. We have that confidence. The Lord performs. Think about what happened in the lives of Zacharias and Elizabeth because they feared not. What happened? Don't, don't say it, just think about it. What happened in the lives of Zacharias and Elizabeth because they feared not? Big things, right? Really important things. Eternity changing things happened. Now consider yourself. I'm not saying compare yourself, but I'm saying consider yourself for a moment and think what, what could you be? What could you do for the kingdom? For God and his kingdom. What could you do if you followed the angel's advice, his counsel, and were not afraid? Feared not and did his will, knowing with confidence that he performs, that God performs. 
Church, when the Lord enters our lives, it can feel like an invasion. His presence changes everything. It turns our lives in a whole new direction. It removes much, but it adds so much more. Uh, Fear not. Because the Lord plans. We have a Lord who plans and he intends to use you in those plans. Fear not because the Lord prepares hearts and he uses his people to go out and prepare hearts to receive him. And fear not because the Lord performs when he says he will. And again, he intends to use you as he performs.